Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Purified by Fire. I am David Cease, and this is the spiritual coaching show to help you find peace, love, and joy in family and work life sanctifying the world one soul at a time. We are here each and every week to help you grow spiritually, to become successful in this life, and to be a saint for the life after. No matter how broken you may be, God is calling you to greatness that only you can fulfill. So come join us and see how he may be calling you. Hello, everyone. This is uh, David Cease at the Fairfax uh, Radio Station. And uh, today's topic is about leadership by example. So effectively and genuinely influence and lead people. People such as your spouse, children, coworkers, and even evangelizing the faith. There are so many books about how to influence and change and lead people, but many emphasize how to approach people, the way you should speak, and what you say but none of them emphasize the actions you do based on your spiritual well-being. Our spiritual well-being drives our good and bad actions. Nobody likes fakes, but want genuine people who act as they truly are based on good spiritual well-being. A person with good spiritual well-being will always drive their actions genuinely, caringly, and for good purposes. It is easy to create fake behaviors and fake verbal communication. But someone who is spiritually good will influence others by their actions that people will want to follow and want to do. This is called leadership by example, or ductus exemplo in Latin. But before we get into our story, I would like to start with a prayer. So let's start with, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord Jesus, help us with another day with Purified by Fire. Help us uh, to listen and hear it through our ears, but enter into our minds as well as our heart. Let us lead us to action and always to you, those actions leading to you. We pray this, O Lord, through your name. Let us pray. Grant, Almighty God, that we may withstand the trials of this world with invincible firmness of purpose, just as you did not allow your martyr, Pope St. Martin I, to be daunted by threats or broken by suffering. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, along the, when I was in high school, um, as you already know, or for the new ones who aren't there, um, I wanted to be in the Marines. But when I was in high school, I was an overachiever. <clears throat> I did very well academically. Um, I was in the honor society. I uh, was in the top 10%, did excellent on my SAT scores, um, you, you know, just very well academically, as well as athletically. Um, I was a scholar athlete. Uh, played, uh, I was the MVP of the wrestling team. Um, I was, um, you know, uh, football, you know, MVP of football team as well, captain of both those two sports. I was also well, um, very, very uh, popular. I was voted the most popular kid in, in my school. So very much of an overachiever. Um, but this desire for me to be a Marine had me at odds with my parents because I wanted to enlist in the Marines. Okay, I didn't want to go to college and become an officer. I wanted to enlist. And so my parents were very at odds with that. And so one day I had a, a deep conversation with my father and, um, you know, arguing why I want to enlist in the Marines and everything. And so my father says to me, he says, don't you want to get married and raise a family? And my response to that was, no, 
I just want to go to a foreign land and kill people. That was my response. Now, I don't think that was a, a nice response that my father wanted to hear, um, but that's what I said. And in those teenage years, that's all I wanted to do was become a Marine so I could go you know, to war and, and fight. I had this vainglory that I would be this great hero. Flash forward 30 years later, and here I am, married for 23 years with six children. You know, I can only imagine what my father's doing, laughing at me, right? Um, but he, he definitely laughed at me, at me. The point of this story is the fact that my father talked about family, and it was great about that, but I was so adamant about not having a family. But what influenced me was not what he said, but what he did. That's what influenced me. He was a family man. He made the family the most important part of his life. He worked for um, the, the state government, and he would come home at between 5 to 5.30. He was always there for dinner. He was always there for my sports events, he, whether he was coaching them, managing them, or watching them. He was always there. He knew it. And he didn't just do it for me. He did it to all my siblings. He showed the greatest example of what it means to be a father, a husband, and a Christian man. Now, he's not even Catholic. He's Lutheran. But this was the example that he gave me. Flash forward 30 years, that's exactly what I've become, a family man. My father gave up a lot to be home. In fact, he would always say I, I, he gave up promotions because he didn't want to work late. So he decided to hold that apart. He, one time he was offered a, uh, a partnership to a surveying company um, uh, and a, one, of, one of his employees that he, he was a manager, he was managed, went off to start his own business and he asked my father to join him as a partner. That company that this person created became a multi-million dollar company. He lost that opportunity to be part of a company that was multi-million dollars because he wanted to be at home. And so that's happened to me. I come home, I regiment my life so that I could be home with my kids and to participate in their events. My brother does the same thing. But the difference between my brother and I is that my brother's a biological son of my father. I'm not. I'm adopted. So this influence that my father had is not biological, but it was something that was outside of that. So it transcended the biological aspect and influenced who I was through the adoption. The point I'm getting at is leadership by example is more effective than conversations or talking or debating or eloquent speeches. It's seeing people really living the genuine life so even though at my teen, rebel, rebellious teenage years, my father tried to convince me about having a family and why an education would be great to support that, it wasn't that would transform me. It was his example and life. And even to this day, my brother behaves the same way. My two sisters are exactly the same way. There are many little dads. And I can point out many other people that I've, I've looked at that helped me influence who I am, not, you know, because of what they said, because of what they did. The leadership by example, the example that they showed. I want to mention a few. First is my father, of course. The second is my father-in-law. And, you know, he struggles with his faith. He's, he's uh, you know, somewhat probably an agnostic, but my father-in-law, though, is a truly man's man. And if I could just, you know, become the man that he is. When he says something, he does it. He's the most reliable person I've ever met in my life. The, um, I met a major, a Marine Corps major, that um, we were in a, uh, basically a court martial, and he helped manage that whole thing. And he was just tremendous. Um, I met a woman who was killed in 9-11. I was part of the... I was in the World Trade Center just before, literally a couple of uh, days before it, it was um, 
attacked, and I met this wonderful Jewish woman. Her leadership style in managing her people, her joy, her sense of, of um, uh, management was so tremendous. She came from a hardship. She was a, a Persian Jew that came and uh, was exiled when Ayatollah Khomeini took over in 1970s. She was a little girl at that time. A great example. She wound up actually dying in 9-11, tri- uh, comforting a woman in a wheelchair. So, great woman. And most of all, the greatest influences are the great saints. St. Francis of Assisi, St. Therese of Lezou, St. John of the Cross. Those are great leadership by examples. So, it is important to understand that the great influencers are not great speakers or talkers or achievers. They will all fade away. People won't remember at all what they will say. But the legacy that you will leave behind is the people, the next generation, that you've influenced by your example. So I want to talk about a little bit about importance of leadership by example, which I'm going to call ductus exemplo. It's the Latin for leadership by example. The first is Jesus. Okay, I want to emphasize what what uh, you know he did, and we're going to read about the washing of the feet. So Jesus here washes the feet of his disciples, and he says, when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and resumed his place, he said to them, "Do you know what I have done to you?" You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one's, one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is no greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Look at that. So that is, he says it clearly right now. I'm giving you an example. And he's going to give us a further example on the cross. That's what he's going to do. So on that same day, he says, I give you a new commandment. I give to you that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. In other words, he's saying is people are going to know who you are and probably want to be like you if you show how much you love them. Again, leadership by example. And the greatest love that he'll say in the upper room is no greater love than to give one's life for another. And that's exactly what he'll do that evening. So, And we see that example on the cross. Ductus exemplo, leadership by example. We'll talk about St. Francis emphasizing ductus exemplo. All right? There's a story that St. Francis, he said to his brother, a fellow brother of his, a fellow friar, and said, hey, brother, let's go down to the marketplace and evangelize. And so he took his fellow brother, Pryor, and walked. And they walked. They walked for about an hour. And eventually they came back out. And the friar said to Brother Francis, said, Brother Francis, why, you know, we we went down there to the market to evangelize, but we didn't talk. And Brother Francis said, we didn't need to. Our actions, we evangelized through our actions. Their presence of being there. People know the sacrifices that friars make and do and the life that they live. That becomes an example. So that's an example from a saintly point of view. I'll talk about work. The Marine Corps has a program. To become a Marine officer, you have to go through OCS, which stands for Officer Candidate School. And the motto of the Marine Corps OCS at Quantico, Virginia, Virginia, is ductus exemplo. That's what it is. Leadership by example. The Marines know that the greatest leaders and influencers 
are not people who take great speeches or say great wisdom of words. It's those that lead by example. Because leading by example creates a culture, a culture of change. It doesn't just, you know, boil up a passion that eventually will die. The leadership by example will eventually go and create a culture. And so that's from work standpoint. From a family standpoint, I'm going to quote a lot from a great apostolic letter from John Paul II called Familius Consortio. My Latin isn't the best, so I might not be saying it the, uh, that uh, Latin perfectly. But, you know, here's one. Christian couples, therefore, this is about priest celibate persons being a, an example for Christian couples. This is why celibacy is so important. Celibacy isn't important, you know, because it cheapens human sexuality and marriage. It actually strengthens marriage. And this is exactly what John Paul II is saying. He's saying Christian couples, therefore, have the right to expect from celibate persons a good example and witness of fidelity to their vocation until death. Just as fidelity at times becomes difficult for married people and requires sacrifice, mortification, and self-denial, the same can happen to celibate persons. And their fidelity, even in the trials that may occur, should strengthen the fidelity of married couples. Think about that. You know, when I'm sitting there going, woe is me, I'm married to this woman, okay, I can look at a friar or a sister and say, wow, they're giving up everything even a spouse, and showing that they're struggling just as I am. And through those both struggles and those examples, we will overcome. That's what it is. And just like me fulfilling my obligation, I become an example to other married couples and even to celibate people as well. Because I always tell celibate people, you know, the only difference between you and I is you have zero, I have one. That's it. It's not like I can go around and have, you know, multiple wives, okay? I still have to be faithful to my one wife. That's the only difference. And yes, I have to struggle with that, just like he has to struggle with zero, or she does as a, as a religious. But St. John Paul II also mentions this ductus exemplo is not just at the individual level. It can also be at the collective. And in this case, he's going to use the family as the collective example, Listen to this. Thus the fostering of authentic and mature communion between persons within the family is the first and irreplaceable school of social life and example and stimulus for the broader community relationship marketed by respect, justice, dialogue, and love. What does that mean? That means the family becomes the ductus exemplo to the society. When people in a family act and, and, and show respect, justice, and love towards each other, that becomes a stimulus and example to the outside world. So Douglas' example is not just by the individual. It starts with the individual, but it's also by the collective in the family. This is why the family is so important. So... So that, that's to explain, okay, the importance of leadership by example, the Ductus Exemplo, okay? So let's talk about the need of Ductus Exemplo in our relationships to grow, all right? And I'm going to talk about each one of these because I'm going to create this into a series. I'll call it the Ductus Exemplo series, the Leadership by Example series. But we need to have Ductus Exemplo with our spouse, all right? So many spouses think that, and this is where marriages fall into problem, is that they think they can control their spouse, okay? Or they think that what happens is they, the, the marriage goes on, they're happy and everything, and then all of a sudden they realize that <coughs> their spouse has some imperfections, some issues. So now I have to go and change those imperfections and changes. And then when they know that they can't change them, they start getting angry. Actually, they start getting frustrated then angry, 
then it no longer is love anymore. Dr. Exemplo says, I don't want to change my spouse through worldly means. I want to change them through my actions, my action of love, of patience, generosity, of self-sacrifice. That's Dr. Exemplo. That's how you can do that. And it's less frustrating, it's more peaceful, because the only one you can change is yourself. I love this quote from Ephesians 5.21. It says, be subject to one another out of reference for Christ. That's the same section in which it says wives be subject to your husband. But the one thing that people mis- believe, uh, mis- mis- is misleading in that quote is that be subject. Husbands and wives need to be subject to each other. When we were married, I didn't say my wife is subject to me. I said, I will be your husband. I will give myself to you as my wife. And conversely, my wife said the same. I am your wife and I will serve you. In this mutual serving and loving is where we get perfect love. And the only way that we can grow in that is not trying to convince our wives and do all these great things, but to become a better and greater saint and lead by example through that experience. Pray more. Always strive for that. And people will follow. Dr. example on parenting. This is so important. Parents want to control their children. And I, I can honestly say that, you know, and, and it's, this is documented, you know, children go through many cycles. You know, you have adolescence period, you have your tweens and all those periods of life. But the greatest transition of that period is between, you know, when they hit their teenage years. You know, I have six children, and, and by this summer, I will have six, four out of those six will be teenagers. So I'll have four teenagers, a mix of girls and boys, mostly boys. And the why it's, it's, people have so much problems with teenagers is because you can't control them anymore. I mean, you can put guidelines and policies and everything, but if, but if you start controlling them, they're just going to create more and more animosity and they're going to rebel. You have to no longer control them, but you've got to mentor them. That's what you've got to do. You have to mentor them. You have to be a coach and love them. And the greatest coach is ones who can also lead by example. Okay? So that's really important to understand. Dr. Exemplo. As I said, in my own example, when I was a rebellious teenager, what influenced me the most and all my other siblings was the example that my father had, which was the love of his family and his wife. So, Dr. this example. I want to read a scripture quote. It says, well, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Now, we always think that it's some kind of a person who causes a person to sin, his children to sin. But you know what the number one cause of sin is? Bad example. That's what it is. How do you show a child that it's important for them to go to Mass if you don't go to Mass? How do you show them that God is important when you're watching television, when you're not praying? Duct is exemplo. Leadership by example. That doesn't mean that we should be fake. No, it means that we have to change our being to become that holy person, to lead them to Christ through our actions. That's what's important. Ducto exemplo in evangelizing. I cannot express how this is important. I, you know, realized when I was doing apologetics that I was not an effective person because I wasn't even, you know, I was very impatient, bombastic, and wanted to conquer people as opposed to truly loving them and caring for them. 
That's why I stopped apologetics. Because I cannot, you know, preach love when I'm not loving. How can uh, you know you preach about you know uh, patience when you're not patient? Okay, you become really, really bad. I want to read you a scripture quote that hits this on the nail really well. It, it's Jesus saying to the Pharisees, "Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites!" For you traverse sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. What does that mean? That means these Jewish people, the the Pharisees, were converting people to Judaism, but because their actions were so bad that they just fell into bad actions. That's what we do. We can preach all we want about love, about kindness, patience, fortitude, prayer. But if we don't do that, then you're really making these people into worse. You're putting God in a box. And that's what you're teaching your kids. That's what you're teaching people who evangelize. Because just because a person becomes Catholic doesn't mean they're going to heaven. We have to focus on them to become holy. And holiness is only brought about by good example. All right? A um, good example of that is, I don't want to talk badly about priests, but I will mention that we had this wonderful priest that we thought were going to be wonderful. He does a traditional mass. He, he says the greatest homilies you can ever think about. But when he came on board we realized his actions didn't correspond to what his homilies and his preaching was all about. It was like a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And that right there can alienate anyone. In fact, we had a, to the point where we actually left the church, left meaning this, this, this particular church, because it was just scandalous. So it's about example. Okay? Duck this example at work. How many times, um, you know, do we have to look at work? The greatest example of duck this example at work is St. Joseph. Now, there's no quote in the Bible that I can quote because he didn't say anything. But he did everything. We know he was a carpenter, you know, through Jesus when he said, who is this? Isn't he the son of a carpenter? We know his occupation. We know that he listened to God. We know he was able to defend his family, being exiled to uh, Egypt and then coming back and settling in Nazareth. We know a lot of about Jesus. I know we know a lot about Joseph because of Jesus. His doctus exemplo became Jesus. God chose Mary and Joseph to be the great example to be for Jesus. Remember, Jesus was pure human and God. So when he was on earth, he had to learn everything from a human standpoint. Okay? So how did he learn about love? How did he learn about this from a human state? Through his mother. That's why Mary had to be imper- oh, I'm sorry. Mary had to be perfect, because there's no adulterated sin that could be contaminating um, Jesus in his youth growing up, born as well as growing up. And you know, we uh, you know Joseph is is so, uh, is almost secondarily perfect, as as uh, theologians some say is that. Mary is, you know, near infinite. Joseph is near immaculate. Second greatest saints. Duct is exemplo. So that's why we need to have leadership by example. It's so important. Now, why does leadership by example work? Why does that, this example work? Well, I can think of six right now, probably maybe seven. The first is theory into action. 
theory. So many people love to talk about the theory, oh, the love, and intellectualize everything. But when it comes to action, all right, it's like, oh, it's like, wow. It's great about talking about faith and how you have it. But St. James says this. He says, you say you have faith, but I can show you my works or my actions that underlies my faith. Theory into action. Dr's example works because it's not a person who's there talking about their faith, talking about love, or talking about patience, kindness, but it's truly acting upon them. That's why. Number two, gives the example of behavior. Now, especially younger kids or people who don't know what it means to be a Christian. You know, it's great to talk about love and all this other stuff, but seeing the example of it, giving examples through our actions is great. Oh, you know, for example, um, I'll give you an example. One time um, I wanted to know how how do I slow down and eat because I, I do eat a lot. That's one of my, my biggest things. And um, so I wanted to kind of be able to learn how to slow down. So one day I was talking to a friend of mine. Um, she's very thin. And I was watching her eat her salad. And, and the way that she was just eating it very slowly, she would start conversing. And I was just mesmerized about how she was eating salad. Why? Because I was like, that's an example of how to eat slow. It's the same thing. It's great to talk about love, but where does, what does it mean? How, how do we see it? Where is it an example of that? How do I show compassion? Where, you know, how do I do that? And Douglas' example shows that. When a mother is patient with her child as the child is having a temper tantrum, or a teenager just says a sly remark and doesn't yell back, but gently reminds her, the daughter, that's disrespectful. Okay? That's the example. Third is it creates a virtuous life. Why? Because of two reasons. It becomes a way of life when you live with a person who does that. In other words, for example, my father, his example of making the family important and seeing him there was an expectation that I saw. I expected it. Right? And it became a virtue that innately I took over. Now me as being a father. It's a repetitive learning experience. I saw my father always there. Oh, there's my dad. He's at the dinner table. Oh, there he is. There he is. There he is. There he is. And that's how you create virtue. Virtue isn't created because you do it once or twice or you do it for a week or two. It's lived constantly. So a person who does duck this exemplo and leads by example will consistently behave the way that they need to. Okay? So that's why it works. Four is that it allows people to see that it really works. It is possible. It is possible for me to love and act that way. I mean, it's great to talk about theory, about love, and about family being in there. But if I didn't see any of that happening, would I just say, is that even possible? Is that, is that a bridge too far? But it shows an example. It shows that it can be done. The fifth is that it gives us role models. It makes us think and look and say, man, I want to be like that person. And the sixth is that it is genuine and not fake. No one likes fake people. People like genuine people. And people who are living a virtuous life, who do Ductus Exemplo, they are genuine people. So, and I would add the seventh, which is that it really transforms the world. It, may, it has more of a transformational power than anyone else. Any other achievement. I will carry on the legacy of my father of making the family a priority, and I'm doing it right now. And my children will probably do it. Maybe not all of them, but most of them will. And they will pass it on to their children. 
You see, before there were societies, before there were rules, before there was anything, there were always a family. And that is the most important. So, duck this example, why it works. Now, let's talk about focusing on spiritual well-being and not behaviors. So, I want to talk about that the greatest difference between the Catholic Church and the catalyst for change between the Catholic Church and worldly ideology is this. That the Catholic Church realizes that good and bad behaviors are caused by spiritual well-being. If you look at what all the sacraments are for. It's there to heal, to strengthen our spiritual well-being, and to cure our spiritual well-being. But the worldly view says no to spirituality and only to the worldly behaviors. That's what it is. So they emphasize drugs. They emphasize, you know, how to better articulate things. They emphasize things like, oh, fix your finances. And I always say this, is that those problems really are stem from, those are just the symptoms of the real illness, which is a spiritual problem. You know, I find that a lot of of, um, Catholic marriage courses are now tending to, which I, I think is really bad, towards, you know, focusing on finances focusing on um, better communication. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. I mean, um, and something that, you know, shouldn't be at least glazed over. But marriages are not broken because of those reasons. Those are just symptoms of a deeper issue, which is a spiritual issue. It's a spiritual issue. It's the selfishness that they have inside of them. That's what happens. The lack of forgiveness, lack of patience, all of this. So it's a spiritual problem, right? I remember one time a friend of mine told me that she, uh, she was able to talk to a woman who uh, manages all of the, um, um, what do they call them, annulments in, in this diocese. I forget what diocese it was. I think it was the Archdiocese of New York. And... Um, this uh, woman who handles the tribunal said, you know what the number one reason is why people get annulments? The lack of forgiveness. That's a spiritual problem. You know, Jesus forgives all sins, everything. We must as well. So the real outcome here to understand Dr. Exemplo and the way that we get to that level is being you know, at a good spiritual state. That's the importance. Cure the real illness, which is our spiritual state. All right? That's the most important. I want to read you a couple of quotes from uh, the Bible. Now, they, they, they use the word heart, but we can also say spirit, you know, or soul. It says, a man's heart changes his countenance either for good or for evil. That's Syrac 13.25, which means that our spirit can change our countenance, how we behave easily through good or evil. Remember, we're, we're, we're substituting heart with soul, spirit. Here's another one. And this is from um, uh, John. This is from the gospel. Okay? This is what Jesus says. But what comes out of, a, of the mouth proceeds from the heart. What comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a man. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a man. So what Jesus is saying is that, you know, we have to understand that it's our insides. When our insides are desiring these evil thoughts, these murderous, adulterous, and and, uh, slanderous um, ways, our actions are going to follow. It's just going to happen. That's why in the Ten Commandments, some of them are covet. Okay? Because covetousness 
is a spiritual problem that says, I really, I, even though they're not physically doing anything wrong, cover, coveting that neighbor's wife, you know, you know, that's not, you know, he's not committing adultery physically, but he is spiritually because it's going to lead to it. Okay? So it's important to understand this spiritual battle, okay, that we have to focus on cleaning our spiritual life to become that great example. To create, so basically, you, you create a good spiritual life, which will create good natural actions, which will be actions that will exemplify great Christian behaviors. Hence, Dr.'s example. Now, I want to talk about, real quickly, Eastern mysticism, because so many times I find that people who, want, who find that they have spiritual problems, they chase after Eastern mysticism, you know, something like Buddhism or something like that, um, or uh, even like um, yoga or something like that. And Father Dubay, uh, God rest his soul, um, I, li- I was able to listen to his, one of his talks many years ago uh, on tape, this was not live, and Father Dubay one time talked eloquently about the difference between Eastern mysticism and Catholic mysticism or Catholic spirituality. The difference between Eastern spirituality and Catholic spirituality. Because so many people are chasing after uh, Eastern spirituality because they think there's, they can find some peace in there. All right? But what he says, and I'm going to summarize it, is that the difference between Catholic spirituality and Eastern uh, spirituality is this. It's nihilism versus love. The objective end between Catholic spirituality is love. The fruit of Catholic spirituality is love. While Eastern mysticism is nothing more than nihilism. Nihilism means nothingness. Nihil is Latin for nothing, okay? Nihilism is nothingness. They, in essence, find peace through just separating themselves from the world. Okay? That's the objective. While Catholic spirituality, the byproduct or the fruit of it, is love. Now, what is love? Okay? Why is this important? Because love is, I say this, okay, peace and joy within chaos is love. So Catholic spirituality focuses on peace and joy within the context of chaos, within the context of suffering. That is love, okay? So, for example, when we find chaos in our family, because we're trying to change diapers, kids are yelling and screaming. Catholic spirituality will help us find that peace and joy in that scenario. That's what happens. Great example of that is Mother Teresa. No one in their right mind would ever think about helping decomposing bodies dying in the gutter in the streets of Calcutta. The the people who were dying in those streets literally had maggots all over. They smelled. Every ounce of your body just wanted to scream out, this is disgusting. Yet Mother Teresa was able to love each and every one of them, treat them with the dignity of the humanity that they deserved. That is Peace and joy within chaos equals love. So Catholic spirituality is not focused on extracting oneself out of the world to find peace, but actually finding peace in God, joy in God, and working in the world as it's going throughout That's love. So that's why when we talk about good spirituality, we can't talk about Eastern mysticism and those because, again, that is that those are very crutch-like behaviors. 
all right? Um, and I've seen it. You know, I remember one time I, um, I go to Delhi Mass and I bring my family, my whole, my whole family goes there. And one time uh, we convinced a, um, a couple to go to Daily Mass. They went um, and they, they really enjoyed it and they continued to go. So after you know, a couple of years, I, I, asked one of the, I asked the wife, I said, hey, you know, it, you know Daily Mass is great. You know, um, why don't you bring your children? You know, you, you, know you, you need it just as much as, you know, they need it just as much as you do. And she looked at me and she said, bring them to Mass? I don't want to lose the peace that I have by bringing them to Mass. In other words, she was treating the Catholic Church nothing more than Eastern mysticism, a place where she could find peace. You know, and I'm not saying that you should bring all kids to Mass because, you know, if you have, you know, kids are rambling. But the point is that we don't use Mass as a way to escape the world. Friars and sisters don't run away from the world by entering a monastery or a friary. They enter it precisely because they love the world. So we can talk about that a little bit later. But I want to emphasize that, that there's a big difference between Eastern mysticism that brings a certain level of peace, but it's a crutch-like peace, as opposed to Catholic spirituality. The other thing I want to talk about is, and this is very important because I've seen it so many times, just because we go to daily mass, regular confession, or say a lot of novena does not mean we are change of heart or cured in our spiritual well-being. It takes a deep desire to become a saint and seek holiness to transform our soul and act for good. So a sound spirituality is not just by going to Mass, whether it's daily or whatever. This is why you can see people go to daily Mass who haven't changed or go to confession and they haven't changed because it just becomes a car wash to them. It has to be a will to change. You know, Catholicism, grace is not superstition. It's not magic. Grace builds upon nature, and we have to put a level of effort into it. So the biggest difference to become, to, so we have to understand that our spiritual well-being affects how we act. How we act will be that example for others. So we really want to have a deep um, ability to influence people. We have to have good actions. Those good actions are based off of good spiritual well-being. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about are what are the spiritual obstacles to duck this example for good leadership by example to good actions? So I broke this down into the three enemies of the soul, and they're very easy to, you know, so that we can talk about. The first is the self and the flesh. Okay, that's going to be your first obstacle. Okay, and it's honestly, as I told before um, on other topics, the hardest is the self. The easiest to get rid of fight is the world. The second easiest is the devil. The self is the worst. It's the hardest to fight. And the self and the flesh. So there's two things to know, you know, talk about with the self and the flesh. One is temperament. So. When we were all born, we have some temperaments. St. Thomas Aquinas talks about that. So in our temperament, we have weaknesses that we need to overcome through spiritual activity. So temperament, these are things that we were born with and we are weak at. Okay? Uh, so for example, um, I'm a very... Um, uh, I'm not very regimented. I don't like being regimented, but I have to have be regimented to do my prayers and do everything. So I have to work at that. For some people, being regimented very easy. Um, I'm a very emotional person. Okay, my wife isn't. All right, um, I have to work on not getting angry, not expressing my emotions too quickly. So I have to work on it. That's a temperament that God has given me. The next level after that is nurture. Through my own experience or lack of experience, I became a certain person. So this is where parents have a deep influence over kids is the nurture aspect of it. Because a lot of times I find that it, parents actually overprotect their children and they lack experiences to grow. 
all right? So part of our spiritual problem is either the experiences, good or bad, or lack of experience, good or bad, all right? So, for example, um, I've seen like a lot of parents, they'll shelter their kids, and they go, oh, you know, they can't do that. Uh, we have a policy in our house. I told my, my, my son, once you turn 18, you're fending yourself. You know, you have to find your own money. You have to go for work on your own. And they're like, Dad, how can I do that? And Well, you know what? You need your own experience to be who you are. I purposefully send my kids away from um, my house to live alone, away from college, away in college, because I want them to have their own experience of, of living by yourself. Because ultimately, that's what they're going to do. So that's what we're doing, you know, having them have to figure out, oh, how do I spend this money? How do I, you know, because I can talk to them until the blue in the face on you know, how to live by themselves, how to survive, how to make money, how to save money, all that other stuff. But until they do it themselves, they won't be able to learn. So experiences, and some of those experiences are good and bad, okay? So nurture affects us um, on our spiritual behaviors, the next is, we, you know, when we talk about the self and the flesh, that are obstacles, is that our flesh naturally wants to go after pleasure and avoid suffering. All right? So we have to overcome them. Because right? some of the stuff that we have to do um, is going to be difficult. It's not going to be easy. Now, who in their right mind wants to have six kids? Right? You know? If you talk to people, I, the, the order is like, I don't know how you do it. Well, it's because of love. I spiritually conditioned, you know, and know what love is all about. And so by having more children, I'm actually becoming more loving because I'm exercising that love muscle. The next is rewiring of our passions to will the good. So our passions, by nature, you know, um, are, are attracted towards, it's saying the good is all this pleasure, it's good, is all this stuff. Now I have to rewire them to say, no, the good is really heaven. The good, you know, what's really evil is, is, is Satan and hell, okay? So this is so that rewiring, and that's an obstacle because that's really what we've got to do in our spiritual life. We have to conquer our, our pleasure. We have, you know, uh, we have to actually change what we, we became because of our temperament and our experiences, but then we have to, you know, reconfigure our selfish, you know, fight our, ple seek for pleasure and avoid suffering so we can rewire our passions that are good, that are seeking God as the ultimate good as opposed to worldly things. So that's the self. Now the world. The world becomes a, uh, an obstacle mainly because you're going to hear the common word, filling. It fills our mind. It fills our minds with worldly solutions of influence, money, sex, power. That's how you influence people. If I had power, I can control that. I can do what I want. You know, if I had money, I can do whatever I want. Uh, filling your mind with blaming the world. Oh, it's not your fault. That's the problem. It's their fault. Instead of looking inwards, they will look outwards. They're the problem, not you. Uh, filling your mind with limited techniques to chase after. In other words, the world will say, well, you know what? It, the problem isn't you. It's the, in, in, in a spiritual sense, it's, it's just how you're communicating. It's just, now, I'm not saying communication skills aren't necessary. I'm just saying that they put all their effort. It's the end all or be all to the solution when it's not. It's very limited. Okay. The real response comes from, you know, spiritually healing yourself of the baggage that we carry because of our temperament, because of our experience or lack of experience and everything, and our passions that need to be rewired. Okay? That's really what it is. Uh, filling with our ideas with spirituality and Catholic Church is useless. Right? The world just says, oh, you know what, Catholicism is all about pray, pay, and obey. Just sitting in your knees and praying your rosary. It doesn't do anything. It just says, just keep doing that with no useless, with useless thing and kneeling all the time. When really, spirituality 
in the Catholic Church has the cure. It really does. It's the cure, and it maintains it. It's everything. Using drugs to sedate our soul and never exercising our soul to overcome. The use of drugs to modify our be external behaviors is the most common practice that's happening in, in nowadays. Instead of using our soul to drive what we're supposed to be doing, we are now sedating, using drugs to control our behaviors, which is a recipe for failure because they're not exercising their spiritual capabilities. They're just sedating them and using drugs to modify them. And lastly, and this is a big one, the world distracts us in saying that the spiritual stuff is so unimportant. You know, it's so unimportant. What's important is our job, it's our hobbies, it's sports. That's what it is. Now, I'm not saying watching sports is, is bad. I mean, I see games every once in a while. But when people know more about the statistics of a baseball player on multiple teams than Saints, that's kind of weird. When you know more about these you know, inconsequential uh, uh, facts over the facts of the church and spirituality, that's a problem. That's a distraction. When, avoid, when, when you're seeing a game rather than going to church or mass or confession, that's a problem. Same thing with work. So this is the key from the world standpoint. Now, the third obstacle is the devil. The devil wants to make you feel like you're a failure. You know, do you ever feel that? You know, you hear it like, oh, you're a failure. And he does that by using Peth Book is to hast experiences of failures. You know, everyone fails. That's life. But the greatest thing about failure is you can learn from them. You know? When you did your homework, did you get it straight 100s when you did your homework? No. That's what correction is all about. When a teacher corrects your math book, it's to help you understand where you failed so you can grow from it. But what Satan wants to do is he wants to take your past failures, okay, when you got angry, when you, when you uh, wasn't, weren't patient, or you we were overly controlling or whatever, and make you feel like you're a failure and quit. I can't do it anymore because I'm a failure. Satan will whisper that into your ears. The second is he'll make you feel like it's impossible to change. Oh, you can't do this. You can't change. This is too tough for you. You're not. You can't do it. Okay? Have you ever watched The Passion of the Christ and they see, that's what Satan says to Jesus. Who are you? You can't do this. You can't be the sacrifice for all of humanity. He's going to make it sound like it's impossible. But love and grace will conquer all. Making you feel like it is not working. That's what happens. Oh, it's not working. You tried it already. You tried it for three months, and your, your patience isn't going to be any better than what it is right now. Okay. In fact, you've gotten worse. Why don't you make it feel like it's not working? Spiritual is not working for you. No, no. Just go back to your old ways. The devil will say, make you feel like you are just a doormat. Oh, if you do this, you're going to be a doormat. People are going to walk all over you. you know, the only way that you can you know, effectively change people is by yelling at them, by screaming at them, by, making, by doing the bad things that they're doing to you because you don't want to be a doormat. You're above that. Who are you to let your children walk all over you or your spouse to walk all over you or your employees to walk all over you? The doormat is going to make you feel that way. E, making you want to control the situation. For some, this is not for all, but, but for some, yeah. Satan's going to be like, oh, you can take control right now. You're the boss. You know, you're the father of the house. You're the husband. You're the man of the house. You take control. That is what's going to happen. And control in the devil's eyes is always anger, violence, and destruction. That's what it is. Now, I'm not saying that you can't get angry emotionally, but a lot of times we misrepresent anger for frivolous reasons. Okay? There is justifiable anger, but in most cases, 
it's better to be patient, kind, gentle. But Satan will say, take control, take some action. And that usually means violence. Uh, planned old, uh, and then plain old frustrating you and making you dive into yourself in a selfish manner. So Satan, in this last one, will make you want to dive inside of yourself. You know, oh, this is why you're bad. This is, you know, don't worry about other people anymore. Just worry about yourself. That's all you want to worry about. You know, because at the end of the day, the reason why we want to fight the spiritual obstacles is so that we can become great examples to our children, to our spouse, to society in general, to our converts. Ductus exemplo. That's the reason why we, um, that's what Satan will do. He'll frustrate you and he'll make you dive into selfishness as opposed to what's the real meaning of it. We're at the hour. Um, I'll go real quickly over um, some uh, ways, steps that you can make changes to, to a spiritual sense, okay? Uh, not all of them, but some of them. Uh, realize you can change and need to change. This is the biggest thing. Just realize you need to change. You need to change. A lot of people are just happy. Oh, I am what I am. No, you have to change. And by changing, you set your goal by becoming, wanting to become a saint. That's number two, wanting to become a saint. Three, stop trying to control others. Okay, that's going to be the biggest battle. Four, understand that I can only change myself. Five, be humble. All right, so I want to tell you uh, this, one thing. Humility isn't denying your good attributes. All of, God gave us talents. Okay, um, God gave us talents. We use those talents for good. We also uh, understand is we also have weaknesses. We have to be understanding of weaknesses. I read a book about a woman who, you know, sometimes the way that you can understand your weaknesses is by, by actually talking to your worst enemy and listening to them. There was a story about a woman who um, had a, um, a maid, and that maid she didn't like. And one day, the woman was so drunk that the maid yelled at her and said, you are a lush. You are a lush. And the woman stopped and realized that she was. She was an alcoholic. And she stopped. Her worst enemy gave her the best of advice, the true advice. And that was that she was an alcoholic. Friends don't do that, right? Or so-called friends. But this enemy did. This woman, by the way, her name was St. Monica, the mother of St. Augustine. She was an alcoholic. And the reason why she, come, she stopped drinking was because of a hateful argument she had with her maid. So sometimes our worst critics are our best friends, as St. Uh, 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 Thomas, Thomas, uh, Augustine would say. Um, another good way to be humble is watch other people who have better uh, traits than you do and saints. Focus on spiritual well-being and not bad behaviors. This is the key. Don't worry about your bad behaviors. Focus on the cause of them, which is your spiritual well-being. Why, why is this causing you the angst that you need? Why is, why is it doing this? Why is this behavior? Tie it back to your spiritual well-being. And then seven, and this is why I have to end it really quickly though, is that find a spiritual director or coach to help you overcome the spiritual obstacles and it sets you straight. Um, you know, part of, of the mission of Purified by Fire is to be the spiritual coach. I know finding a spiritual director, especially finding a good spiritual director, is very difficult. So you can start off by having a spiritual coach to help you, you know, um, and if you find, you know, a really good spiritual director to take you then to the next level. But you, everyone needs to have a baseline of a good spiritual coach to help out, to create a good framework and lifestyle so that you can grow spiritually, okay? So 
definitely do it because there's a lot involved with it. So that's, that's the mission of Purified by Fire is spiritual coaching to help to pe- bring peace, love, and joy into all of our relationships and everything that we do. And the last thing I want to talk about, about Dr. Dick's Exemplo, is this statement. I coined it myself. You're le- you know, so many people are worried about leaving a legacy, so they, they buy stones, they buy all these things, but, but that's not what's going to leave a legacy that's going to live forever. Your legacy, whether good or bad, is not in what you achieve or say, but your example that leaves an impression on people's minds and act. That is going to be your legacy. Just like my father's legacy is the love for he, what he had for his family, that's the legacy I take to mine. That's a legacy that takes all my siblings take as well, which they share with their kids. So let's end this with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. O Divine Master, grant that I may not seek, and not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it's in dying that we are born to eternal life. O Lord Jesus, help us to die to ourselves, that we might grow become the great saints that we are, that we bear much fruit through our example, through our acts. We ask all for your grace and your guidance as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for joining us at Purified by Fire. Please visit us at purifiedbyfire.com. Like us at Instagram and Facebook at purified.fire sanctifying the world one soul at a time. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me crying out? Like an animal out in the wild. I shout your name into the night. Tell me, can you feel it too? Feel the love like I do. Only you can make it right I shout your name into the night And we call it for you, we call it for you And we call it for you, we call it for you And we call it for you, we call it for you and we call it for you, we call it for you. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafood. Good day.